friend, and as far as teaching goes, there's no one better. Um, he's very inspirational, and uh, his art forms are vast and across the board, so that was awesome. And I um, want to thank the Rock. It's quite an honor. And we want to thank Carol for doing such a great hanging. And we want to thank Linda, because this would never happen without her. We love you. Wherever you are. There you are. <laughs> all our friends and family are coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob can start with reading. Most of you have not seen me with my designer glasses on. So. <laughs> and just so you know, his first public speaking was uh, with Dave Maynard at BU. He got up onto the podium to speak and fell off the other side. So, <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, there's no podium. <laughs> so it kind of all started with um, this title. And uh, Jill and I, back about 15 years ago, when our you know, creative processes started to come together, but I asked her to paint me motif number one on a grassy knoll at night. Mm -hmm. Paint it that way for me. Show me the light rays coming through all the buildings, the giant waves crashing on the periphery, the artists and the fishermen, the village prophets, sirens on the rocks, incendiary lighthouses. Give me the vessels that saunter into port, her masts soaked in salt, the creeks, the sounds of pylons and heavy lines light strokes. Make the night so soft up here, there is always a glow. It never gets dark on Cape Ann. Paint it for me that way, honestly. Witness and interpret the exquisite. The light is better in Rockport. It is more sustaining, uplifting. The village of beauty and integrity. Paint it for me. Her light just filters out and pops and whites. You know this is a spiritual place where we have come to nest create, and to live an inspired life, despite our circumstances, write the new verses, sing the choruses, all those white steeples, and the angels de-winged, walking the streets of the last artist colony left on the east coast of America. A rookery, a sanctuary, <laughs> a better place to be, nothing compares to her fragile integrity and reservation-like beauty. Our colony Paint it for me that way. Depict her sincerity and candor and all her splendor. Show me the structures, the shape, the contours of our village. Depict the characters. Display her as she is, a resilient, tiny art colony jutting out into the North Atlantic Sea, bravely, beautifully, honestly. Just capture that perspective, the trajectory of light as day and night cross our village. And you will accomplish so much, one individual in a peninsula of our salvation. No pressure, huh? <laughs> but he gave me very interesting assignments as well. Um, this was one. Um, I don't know if any of you recognize this. He said, oh, paint me this tonight. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is? More contestants. Yes. It's the Rite Aid symbol. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> Since I always do as I'm told, as my parents will confess <laughs> to that. Um, so this is what happened. I did the mortar and pestle, and as Ron said, the paints just swirled around here and swirled around there, and things happened. I have no idea why. And um, one cool thing, it almost looked like there was something screaming up there, and so I, I found this... Um, Okay. I found this picture of my niece Maya screaming, and um, and so I put her in there. And, um, and so I call this alchemy, which is what we try to create every night. <laughs> and he makes me create every night. <laughs> That's why there's so much up here. So this is alchemy. Anyone feels like checking this out later? This refers to this painting. Paint me this. So I painted that, and then I felt the tree got really lost. So 
I took a bigger canvas and I wanted to do it closer up. And um, that's what happened. <laughs> so um, that's the new muses. Cinder's vision. Her eyes open like a reptilian. Squint a little. What do you see now? When our eyes narrow, we can see within a frame. Decide a code of light hits. The art strikes our retinas at such high speeds. The stimulation exceeds our expectations. Other senses perceive at different rates. This world is just an experience of touch. We need to grab the roots, feel this life before it departs. The tide recedes so far. We can't remember when we were last underwater. When I saw Cinder, I barely recognized her. My soul made a sensitive flower. The ghost orchid blooms only every so often. Open our eyes, artists and ponders. Let the light penetrate the film. Let the image in feel absolutely exposed. Be honest. Acting is tiring. This role is getting boring. Who are we? See through the paint factory. Find the invisible particles that make up reality. When illusion was necessary to hide in the scenery, only felt the sun's warmth was sincere. She gave me all her love unconditional. We could be receptors, creators, having processed the information in a millisecond. Her eyes open wide, having realized the meaning of life is to live it, experience this fleeting state of being. What are you waiting for? Paint your masterpiece today is the slogan we've been waiting for. This time when I squinted, I saw the raw form of a primordial being, just the shape of a thing. It was in her painting, and I knew she was onto something, a self-discovery, sweeping out the chimney debris, a dusty purple vortex, a creative tornado swirls under her. She rises up on the thermals. Cinder's vision is intensified. She looks down the spiral of her life as an ethereal in the here and now. Squint a little. We were designed to recognize rapidly, see the idea and the thing quickly, assess the situation, decide to do something meaningful, create. Her reptilian eyes open receptively for the first time in quite a while. Vision amplified. <laughs> Let me out, you know, and it was 
was great. And um, as you know, we paint every night, between 8 and midnight. And um, one of the nice things about painting big is even if you're exhausted and you feel sloppy, you can just kind of get lost somewhere. And you won't ruin anything because it's very easy to oil paints as I fly around to just wipe out something I really loved a minute ago. But um, <laughs> So fortunately, I had a second opportunity. Um, my mother, who was sad to see the other one go, uh, decided to give me another chance. And um, she was enchanted by little Sandra. She was the last Eastern Dragger, Eastern Rig Dragger in Gloucester, I don't know. There used to be about 200 of them, and she was the last one until about three months ago, and they just sunk her. So she kind of found an image of a boat in the water that she liked, and I had to sort of superimpose little Sandra in there, which was um, interesting. And um, it was uh, a daunting task. In fact, I think the title of the image was Dauntless. <laughs> But, um, and at the end, I wasn't sure quite how it came out until I gave it to her for a few months and I took it back for this to varnish and hang. And I was like, wow, you know, did I do that? That's cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I'll do another five foot one because it was amazing, you know, a totally fresh image maybe. Um, so that's that. Oops, that's okay. the siren on the rocks. Oh, um, well, one thing I find as I paint, and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of painters in this room, I know there are a lot of amazing painters in this room. Oils, I don't know oils especially, but it's the only medium I've really ever worked with except for drawing and markers and stuff, is when you're like swishing around the lighthouses to fill in the sky or whatever, things just appear, you know? And sometimes the most perfect images appear that I could never paint on my own, you know? It would just take me forever and it would never come out good. And, Bob wanted me to point the little siren down there. Uh, she appeared, and um, one of the first appearances, so she was there, she came. You can see that day. One of the ones on this is, I don't know if you can see here, but this is like a horse head, and I don't know if any of you can recognize it. If you look up closely, it's probably the least amount of paint, because it appeared early, and I was like, wow, that's so really cool. And uh, I did my best not to wipe it out, and I think a couple times I probably had to wash it off a little bit, because I... I tend to just sort of fly around and lose track of what I'm doing. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, Bob. Okay, no. yeah. <laughs> um, this was one, it was actually, um, we were on Lover's Key with my dad, and he's an incessant photographer, he takes um, awesome pictures. And he was standing below this osprey nest for about an hour, literally, waiting, waiting, waiting for the shot. And finally that bird hovered and he got it. And um, it really inspired me and I loved it. And when an image hits me, that's usually when it comes out the easiest. Only this was early on and I had rules in my head, you know, what I can or can't do. And um, so this wasn't the original version. The original version has almost every little stick in it. <laughs> um, but it, it was just so in, you know, printed in my brain that I just did this quick color wash because I just had to let loose because I got so d -d 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 -d. And I put it away for three years and this spring I brought it out and I said, do you know, I just love the composition. I'm just gonna go wild and make some crazy abstract and throw pink up and, and, um, and I didn't. <laughs> and so the Osprey came back and, um, and so it, I like to paint things that resonate with me. Either it resonates with me directly, or it has a personal meaning, and since my dad took it, I, um, you know, I felt like an ode to that, so. That's my Osprey Justin. And he, he took pictures of the birds, and <laughs> <laughs> since then I have a stack of pictures from him that are, um, he's anxiously waiting for me to make. Um, and it was funny, when I, when I took this, I said, oh, these birds are so cute, and Bob said, are you crazy? This is like a little too complex, maybe you shouldn't undertake it. And um, so I started it one night and I'm moving around and I'm like, there are 14 birds in this picture. <laughs> and I have to paint 14 birds. I'm gonna, this is gonna take me all summer. But each little bird, when you break it down, they are so cute. And they all have this little look on their face and this little whatever. And, and I did this, you know, in about a week, less than a week. And they just phew, fell out. And um, I maybe mean, could have done more, but I didn't want to ruin them, so that's where I left it. And, um, and one of my favorite things Ron always taught me that I tell everyone, and they said, he says, if you love it, 
someone else will love it. And that has saved my butt a lot. Because <laughs> I'm like, I love it, so um, I'll just put it away and hopefully bring it back out and someone else will love it too. So. And we have a, a much larger version of that, different rendering, but same composition uh, back at our gallery. If anybody ever wants to come back and see it. It's the original great. piece has a little more room. And this is the only ca canvas I had in the house, so it had to crop a little bit. <laughs> Uh, this was a very early painting, probably the first big piece I did, and um, this is just full of images, because um, it was just a boat initially, and um, I get very bored with simple things, and so I make them more and more complex. Um, and so this was kind of all I had, and this is kind of what happened. There's like this spaceman up there, no idea. Um, this, you know, kind of this crisscross, you know, just kind of going up the mast and down the lines and just trying to follow, you know, sort of doing the architecture first. And in the process of the architecture, all these things happen. And, and this woman came and she said, mm -hmm. there's a face and kind of blue hair and arm out. And, and so the painting got named Maiden Voyage. But when I first did it, I wasn't that crazy about it. I thought it looked too rough or whatever. And I hid it away in the bedroom for a while. And Bob said, no, oh, this is great. Maiden Voyage, you have to bring it out. And so I varnished it. and. Um, a lot of people loved it, so that was really good. So <laughs> that was, uh, that's what made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> this was a photograph we took on Granite Pier. Um, our husband is also an avid photographer and takes probably on our computer 60,000 <laughs> pictures. That's since the digital camera, not to mention the huge toy chest I had as a kid just full of uh, prints. And um, I did two versions of this, which was kind of cool, because I, I did work on this, and then I started another one, and I learned lessons from that, and then went back to this, and I went back and forth, and they both came out very different, but that was kind of neat. I love how that's colored like champagne bottles. Well, yeah, yeah. his grandmother actually named it Drunken Buoys. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's... Uh, that's pretty much what it kind of looks like too, so that works for me also. Um, are there any questions? Ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Ask anything. So I can only count 13. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> yeah. an interesting number. Okay, well, everybody's been saying that's so where there's two <laughs> answers to that. Um, you can see 13. But there's actually like a 14 bird somewhere in here that I don't think I caught, but is there. <laughs> number one. Okay. And then number two kind of got logged off, and I thought I captured him on the other side, but there was a little bird over here. <laughs> and um, since my dad's favorite number is 14, I stuck with the 14. <laughs> So I thought that worked. So everybody keeps saying there are 14 birds in that picture. Um, but that's the interesting thing when you start painting these things, is you see things you had no idea were there. And um, I even say to everyone, and it's silly, but these two birds are just mirroring one another, each balancing on the opposite leg, but itching in the opposite direction. So that was cool. So um, thank you, Nancy, for pointing that out. Did you ever want to say, I just wanted to, getting back to this other one, is this a, a mermaid here on the left? Above Over here? On the left. Well, I'll tell you one thing. We, um, <laughs> I, it, it could be. <laughs> I see a lot of different things, but the coolest thing was when we had our first opening, is this one woman came up to me and she said, I see dragons. And I was yeah, like, I thought dragons. <laughs> cool. You should point um, that out to us later. Yeah, maybe okay. afterwards you could come up yeah, close yeah. and show me. But it's kind of like clouds, you know, everybody sees yeah. Yeah. kind of what representational um, thing jumps out at them. So I'm sure there are a lot of possibilities. Yes. Yeah, the dragons are obvious. Cool. <laughs> Your work reminds me a lot of Van Gogh. Uh, were you inspired at all by him? I mean, well, you're not quite psychotic enough. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't spent that much time with me. <laughs> and you're not allowed to say <laughs> I keep um, encouraging her not to cut off any ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody says that to me, and it's funny because um, uh, 
um, being the economics major, there was tons and tons of reading, and, and I really wanted to take this art history course, and that was tons and tons of reading, and reading was never my thing. Um, so I didn't take any of that. So I didn't really know much, except uh, we were taken to a Georgia O'Keeffe show in New York City in high school, and I thought, wow, you know, how does she do that? So um, Bobby, on the other hand, he had installation exhibits in his dorm room. People would come for him to recite poetry, and he spent all his free time at all the various museums in Boston, because he had like a free pass, right? He had the BU student. Um, so he's the one that sort of introduced me and he did show me a painting, I mean, a, um, a movie on Van Gogh. And I think probably the correlation between the two of us, and I can't find this picture anymore, but they showed his palette. And there was no mixing. There was just like things. Like he just stuck the brush in, in the colors, and that was it. And I think that's where we kind of, you know, overlap. Where it's just like red, you know, blue. And as you can see, mostly red and mostly blue. <laughs> But on that note, one thing that's interesting, I try to tell people who are starting out and maybe aren't taking classes, and so they're figuring these things out on their own, as I did myself. Um, when you mix the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, you get mud. So a whole slew of my early paintings were mud. And um, so I finally figured out, there's a couple of things to understand, you have to figure out the oils. And, um, and that will take a lifetime. <laughs> And then you have to figure out how to make the shapes and colors and so on. And so I started out just with blue and red because they didn't complain about one another. Um, mm -hmm. You could put, you, I, and I'm always changing and experimenting, and you could do red over blue or blue over red, and they kind of stay blue or red. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought, well, later then I can add yellow if I want orange or green. Or, mm -hmm. But um, as you can see, some of them just stayed red and blue because I love that, except this one had just a little yellow in the corner. And uh, it's funny, that one, when I stopped, I was like, oh, it really should do more, it's too rough. And, and now I just you love it. Love love it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to Bobby, I said, why can't I buy that? <laughs> so, um, so we'll see how long I hang on to it. I, I always think of, um, I have sold you know, a bunch of them, and uh, I think of them as adoptions. So I try to find good homes for them to go to, um, so I know where they are safely. And, if you adopt um, it, we won't take it back. <laughs> I may visit that visitation rights. Um, uh, well, let me show you guys um, come to the top for a moment. So 15 odd years ago, 16, 17, whatever, 16. <laughs> we, met here, we met here right on the beach on a cold moon night at this exact spot. So this is the significant thing. For us, but um, she wanted me to say there's another writer she wanted me to read, which I didn't bring. Which I'm glad I didn't up. Um, but basically, it sets off. We enter the studio each night, kind of in reverence. You know, we're, we're, there's a, um, it's a, it's you know, it's fun, it's silly, we play, but it's serious too. We we enter, we turn on our music. I sit at my easel, which is a computer, and she goes up to her easel, and we do co-create. We talk. We I come up as soon as I read a paragraph or two. I read while she's painting. She listens, she re re reflects back. I'm looking at her work exactly as she's painting. I'm watching the process. So there really is this, you know, this dialogue going on at, at all times. Um, and with great frequency, um, a lot of the bigger ones I've started to screw to the wall because I have a small um, easel. And there's sometimes writings on the back of things he said or thoughts that have come up. And, um, and I love that until I was told, oh, you're not supposed to. <laughs> but then someone, I think, was it Bruce Turner, said, oh, don't worry about it, the conservators will figure that out. <laughs> and so if it ever comes to the point where it starts to fall apart, that's really good if someone wants to fix it. So, um, so I'm sure that has a thing or two on the back. Um, yeah. Oh. Well, you can see where the buildings were. But this 
is one of his writings, and um, there's four paintings, I think, where I incorporate his words. And um, you can't necessarily make them all out because often I stop because I like something and I'm afraid of ruining it, so I don't touch it again. But it says, see her in her majesty as the sun sets in harbor. Um, I see all these things. I see the greatest, oldest art colony and things. And I see I accentuated because that's, that's really what it's about. It's what we see, you know, literally. And um, there are things on the back. <laughs> well, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> 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 to feel secure, which <laughs> is um, something we'll always be working on. But I was trying to explain to him when my first love was geometry. I thought it was so awesome, you know, how you can take a triangle and make it any way you want, and they all add up the same. So I, I made this 90 degree angle, and I said, look, if you take this and cut it in half, it's 45 and 45, see, it equals 90. And, you know, I just loved it, so I was drawing that on the back for him. But I mean, it's silly and simple, but that's well, just some of this is kind of like personal with And some have more than others. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one more thing, and then uh, is there a question? Uh, oh, well, a while back I was fascinated that you came, you continued painting along the sides, and I was going to ask if you were, you know, got so carried away you wanted to paint on the back, too. But then you're like, ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. Um, you know, what kind of, what music did you play? Everything. Um, yeah, it's all across the board. I mean, it's, a lot of it stays contemporary, but we like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and it could be classical jazz, it really could be anything. But we do stay current with younger scenes than us, you know, and see what's going on. It's always looking for new music to inspire, but, you know, always yeah. the latest, the latest. No, but a lot of it could be ambient or trance, because like, things with too many lyrics, like hip hop is too hard to write to generally, because it's just, there's too many words, you know what I mean? Too many, so it really needs to have a mood or feel take us, you know what I mean? Because you try to get to a trance like there's a state, you know? Well, there's definitely movement changes depending on the music, that's for sure. And a lot of times I'll be stuck, and I just will have no idea what to do, and he'll change the music, and the next thing you know it makes sense, and it goes. And, um, and when the music's frenetic, well, the painting's frenetic. <laughs> In a way, it's like DJing, though, because we do sense, you know, it, and it really does work for us. I don't know if it works for everybody, but it works for us. He makes almost a different playlist every single night, and um, so it's always different. Phil Stefani can attest to yeah. how much music we, um, he's very good, we're constantly sending him music, and he is one of the few people that is constantly telling Bob what he thought. <laughs> Karen Berger was his too. Yes, Karen's a recipient of our music. And um, one thing I'll show you, everybody looks at this and says, well, what the heck is that? And, <laughs> We, um, we love to go north as well as south, and um, we went up to this place in Andover, Maine, and someone said, oh, you should go up and around the mountains, the, um, the satellite station is up there, and we said, what satellite station? And back, I think, when Kennedy was president, um, I think there were six countries that built satellite stations to begin the first satellite television, and so this was in Andover, Maine, and they called it Telstar. And so you're in the middle of the nowhere, in the middle of the woods, dirt road, you come around this corner, and all of a sudden you look down, and someone shaved out the trees, and there's this satellite station there. And this is what it looks like up close. <laughs> and um, I could pass this around, because as I started to paint this, I was like, I'm painting a satellite station. And <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> so, um... That's Telstar, you said. Telstar, yeah, that's what the name of it was. And so it just, you know, happened. And I have no idea why I did stairs. And um, I call this the um, everlasting dog stalker. It reminds me of Willy Wonka. Um, a little, little candy, and maybe that comes from my subconscious. And they used to call Bob the tree man in college because he had this tree poem that he would recite. And um, his friend said, Bob, I hope you're not going to recite the tree poem. <laughs> and um, so far he has not. <laughs> But this looks like the base of a tree, and this looks like kind of a woman, so I look at it as um, kind of representing us. And then there's a lot of kitten and things in there, too. <laughs> but, um, so, this is where some of these things come from. Uh, so. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the sculpture. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. He worked on several <laughs> paintings and, and pieces, Bob, at the same time, or do you do one and stick with it? And then a follow-up question, how long, is, how long does it take for a painting and for a poem? Average. I, well, can I answer quickly just on this? Because I got, I uh, probably write one of these at night, and I don't edit it. That's why it was hard for me to come up here, because I had to come back and list some things. But it's very much a, like a meter base, so I could be right into the music, really. I'm more of a songwriter than anything. So these, I used to have friends who play guitars and put these to music, and they work as songs, too. So a lot of them, you know, some of them may be more awkward than others, you know, you put in refrains in and stuff. Before tonight, you said, um,
one more reading, and I'm also going to say. Unless there's any more questions. <laughs> This one? Oh. <laughs> um, well, I've actually hung it in many different directions, but this is how it started. It was a photograph I took, I think, from Back Beach, looking up. And you can still make out the church, the white church, and one of the pine trees. And over here was like a Shailen Lou. And it had that little stone um, cupola, a little, you know, what, you know what I'm talking about, between front and back beach in front of it. And, <laughs> None of it just seemed to jive. It drove me crazy. And finally, I said, well, you know, I can make this anything. And, um, and I just kind of went crazy and tipped it upside down and tipped it upside down again. And um, Bob's favorite view is the other, is a different way. And I'll show you. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, we get these hung back enough so I don't get yelled at. But this is Bob's favorite way. It looks like a giant goat. And, um, and I love it this way because, again, here's those images. I don't know if you can see it, but here's like this, to me, this perfect horse head and a second horse head, almost like with its leg down here. And I think they're the coolest horse heads, and I could never do that, you know, with my own imagination. It's a goat. Yeah. It's, it's a, a big goat. goat. It's That's a really a goat. big goat. <laughs> yeah. And we had hanging up these for a while, and for the show, we're like, which way are we going to put the wire? And I said, well, you know, let's just start the way it started. And um, then if anyone asks me a question, I'll know what to say. So, <laughs> do I help me? Yeah. Yeah. And I think my favorite part of this was, um, is it on? <laughs> is Ron and Linda were over, and um, Ron's always giving me great advice, and Linda's just always so encouraging, making me feel good about what I'm doing. Is she giving you the look? <laughs> um, Ron said, I forget exactly what he said, but he said, you've got to make this cloud a little more accentuated. And, um, you know, that will bring it all together. And I did, and, and I think that's what just turned me on to keep going, because it was, it was cool the way it, the way it happened. So Ron's responsible for that. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll end on the final reading of the night. When we create the most beautiful saying, do not be afraid of life, you have to live it. To survive, your story needs to be told. There is one religion for each and every one of us. We are original artists. No two water moccasins snakes are the same. Every design is different, like fingerprints and humans. Here comes the most destructive tornado in history, the largest tsunami of meteor striking humanity. You and I are the bravest people I have met. We are courageous individuals to see for ourselves. The way she paints, the way I write, we create. Revolutionaries adjusting the barometer accordingly to the truth of our feelings, the calmest shape of the universe. You and I unwind together, combine our truths, a solar storm in cyberspace, a hurricane of relevancy, the meaning of everything now apparent to me. <clears throat> Delusions don't fit into our paradigm and anomaly. We can't stop our intellects from developing. Concepts keep forming, the rookery, two or three stories tall, no name swamp. We are narrating one of the most amazing journeys in human history. We just think we are inferior to everybody. The water moccasin snake, demonized by society, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm.